Come on. Nope. That made it darker. That made it darker too. I guess. Oh, okay. Hi there. Just got word I'm I'm live now. So how y'all doing? For whoever is live tuning in. Um so I'm gonna do this real quick. I uh as I was texting uh, some folk from our P4CM family, stuff happens. Life, man, life happens. And we might have plans and uh, things we like to kind of uh, get moving on with. And then life happens. We can't predict the day. We can't predict the moment. I mean, wherever you are right now watching this, uh, you, we can't predict the next moment. We have no idea. I mean, my computer could shut off. Uh, that's just life, the unpredictability of life, uh, which is the reason why we got to be grateful uh, that that we belong to Christ for those of us who have placed our faith in him because uh, uh, he is constant. Uh, that will be the only constant thing in our life is God and God alone. Everything else, you know, it is what it is. Um, now, so I want to do this. I, you, many of you might not know who I am, and I'm gonna I'll come back and say who I am real quick. Let me just pray, uh, because we got folk that life happens and and it will throw a wrench in your plans, and, and we all need to pause and and trust our savior, uh, and that it didn't throw a wrench in his plan. So let me pray, please, bow with me, uh, Father God. We come before you, and um, I thank you for being constant. Uh, you are the great I am. You don't change. Uh, there's no shadow of your turning. There's no variation in you. Uh, you're the only constant in this life. And because of sin, uh, you know, there are things, hiccups, changes are inevitable in our life, but not in yours. And so thank you for rescuing us and um, allowing uh, you to be our anchor so we can hold on to you when life throws things our way uh, and knowing that it doesn't catch you by surprise. And so help it to increase our faith, uh, help, help, help us to hold on uh, in those moments and uh, trust you uh, to work it out for your glory and our good. And so uh, for my fellow fam, P4C and fam that, that's had a very difficult day today, I pray that you would uh, be with them you would uh, assure them that they are not going through it by themselves. Um, and uh, whatever it is that they are facing, uh, you are right there. Uh, you will provide whatever is necessary uh, and you will get glory. You will glorify yourself through this situation for they are your children. They're your child. Uh, you will, And you take care of yours. You're not an absentee father and we can stand firm on that reality. So bless and be with them, provide them what they need internally uh, the patience, the faith, the strength, um, product, provide them whatever they need externally, Lord God, favor, um, uh, 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 what, you know, folk to come around and support, whatever, uh, just and, and respond right on time, right on your time, uh, even if that might look different than our time. And for anybody who is watching that might be wondering who I'm talking about or what I'm talking about, I pray they would just pray and stand in agreement and that the body of Christ would rally around the body of Christ for your namesake. And this I ask and pray. Amen, Jesus. Okay, so, yep, that's how you started live, man, because it's live. So if it's live, you get stuff that happens live in the moment. My name is Chris Davis. I am a pastor up in Bakersfield, California. Um, I am a P4CM vet, been, been involved with P4CM since 2009. There are many things that you guys, if you follow P4CM, that you enjoy that you probably wouldn't realize uh, my role uh, in it in the past, you know, played a very major part in maybe what it is or where it is today. Um, and I'm grateful that I had opportunity to be a part of P4CM for so long and, and ex, 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 uh, especially in those earlier days uh, of where it is today. So 
Uh, shout outs to everybody else, part of the P4C and family that, that put these things on, the live, uh, the rhetorics. Uh, and uh, I see so much going down with P4CM with uh, the different media outlets. I think that's awesome. Continue, guys, continue to do what you guys are doing. Uh, and I here to stand and support you guys and promote you guys as much as I can. Um, for anybody that's here live, um, it is 406. Let's let's if you if you tell me where you're from. Um, I shouted out last week, last Friday, some folk from Arizona. Uh, we had some folk from L.A. And then I happened to uh, go and, and look at it on YouTube um, like earlier this week. And I saw we had some folk from from other parts of the country. Uh, and that was dope. So uh, tell me where you're from. SoCal representing. That's what's up. Um, I spent some time down in LA. I miss it at times, but I do like where I'm at. <laughs> Elliptical at the gym. That, that'll stop me dead sentence. Don't hurt yourself, whoever you are, but keep running. Okay. It's good. Burn off them calories if that's what it is you're trying to do. Uh, Chicago, what's up, Chi Town? Looking forward to coming to check you guys out at some point. I got to get out there to, uh, um, um, to a legacy, man. If you're in Chi-Town and you haven't jumped on to Legacy Disciple, please go to a legacy, okay? It will bless you. You thank me later, okay? Um, Illinois, what's up? Uh, Louisiana, oh man, if I could hear your accent, put a smile on my face. I love some Southern folk accent. What's up, Maryland? I'm from Baltimore, so let's represent East Coast. Riverside, all right, I see you, River. I don't even know how to pronounce that word, Tobago, and I might be jacking that up. That that just show you my ebonics right there. Don't even know how to pronounce it. Okay, the Caribbean. <laughs> all right, glad to see you guys all up on here. So, uh, welcome, and uh, for whoever else might chime in later, uh, it's good to have you here. Again, my name is Chris. I'm a pastor up in Bakersfield, California. Um, I've been married to my wife now for 18 years. This past September, we have three stellar kids. Our kids make us look like better parents than we really are. Shout out to the grace of God for that, right? For reals. Um, and uh, P4C event, been around with P4CM since 2009. Okay. All right. So that's enough little intros right there. Oh, we got Zambia, Africa. Oh, man. Only if my wife was here, she'd probably make her pop her face right up out here and say hi and start speaking in that African language. She went to on a missionary trip in, uh, in uh, Ghana and she just called it her second home uh, and then went and got her DNA samples and found out she's like six, 70 percent African, like straight from the continent. Africa and it's like spread out all throughout the South and the West. So uh, she was extremely ecstatic to be like, yep, I'm claiming it. I'm pure African. <laughs> so shout out to Zambia, Africa. Um, so our, our question today, this, this three part series we're doing is tackling tough questions. And the question today is um, a real doozy for real. It is if God knew Adam and Eve would sin, why did he bother to create them? And that is a question. Okay, that's a question for the ages. You have many of folk probably much smarter than I that have sought to answer that question and many have gotten it right. And I'm sure it's because of, you know, many heresies out, uh, many have got it wrong as well. And so I trust and pray uh, that through my study and through as we explore God's word, uh, we will come with a proper sound answer according to scripture uh, that hopefully will encourage all of us uh, as we seek to answer and tackle this tough question. So let me knock this one out the park. Uh, one of the things we're presuming is God knows all things. And so you, you can't have the God of the universe and him not be all knowing. Otherwise, He's not real. He's not sovereign. He's not completely sovereign. And if he's not completely sovereign, that's not God, capital G. Uh, so the Bible declares God is completely and totally sovereign, uh, which implies a number of uh, characteristics to him being all knowing, him being all powerful, uh, him being all present 
him being all perfect. These are some characteristics of his sovereignty. And from Genesis to Revelation, you can't deny it. And so uh, within that question, we're assuming that God is all knowing and he is. Scripture declares that I'm not really going to spend a lot of time there because I want to get to the crux of this question, which is if he's all knowing and he is and he knew, you know, regardless to the side of the theological stance you might be on, um, whether he knew it because he predetermined it or he knew it because he foresaw it, whichever side you stand on, I'm not going to argue that right here either. Um, but if God's all knowing he knew Adam and Eve would sin, why would then he go ahead and, and create them? Um, and you might not like my first answer, but it, it is what it is. And uh, I think for us as creatures, uh, we need to realize that God is much, 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 and keep adding the word much bigger than we are. And so uh, the first response to this question is because he can that's why he created Adam and Eve after knowing that they were going to sin. He still created them because he can. He can do whatever he want. He's God. So let's look at some, some passages that kind of highlight this. In Psalm 115, I'm going to read verse 3. I'm going to jump around through Psalm and Job and Daniel to kind of show you some verses and passages that just uh, uh, declare that God can do whatever he wants because he's God. So Psalm 115 verse three says, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases, period. He does whatever he chooses to do because he's God. Then I'm gonna go to Psalm 135. Psalm 135 verses five and six. And it says, for I know, excuse me, for I know that the Lord is great. Our Lord is above all gods. Now, that's not implying that there are actually other gods out there. What the psalmist is implying is that God is above everything. Whatever we can deem up to be a God, which in this case, for those back on the Old Testament, would have been false gods, idols. Uh, for us today, it can be other religions. Uh, it can be science, etc. It does not matter. Our Lord is above all others everything. He sits on top, king of the hill, and nobody even close to his hill. For I know that the Lord is great and our Lord is above all gods. Verse six, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all the deep places. There it is right there. Again, God can do whatever he wants, wherever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, because he is God. We are his creation. He is not our creation. and He can do whatever he wants in his creation, with his creation, disregarding his creation, regarding his creation. It does not matter. This is God and this is his world and he can do whatever he wants in and with his world. Um, I'm going to continue go on though so you can see it. I'm going to Job 23, Job 23, verse 13, and it reads, but he, God, is unique. There is none like him. He alone stands alone. There is no other entity, no other being. There is nothing like God. He is the, the epitome of unique. He is unique. And who can make him change? And whatever his soul desires, that he does. You see this being declared again here in Job. Listen, God stands apart from everything else because he alone is the creator. Everything else is the created. He alone is unique and he can do whatever he wants and nothing nor anyone can make him change because he is God. And then I'm going to go to... Daniel, Daniel chapter four, read verse 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. This is King Nebuchadnezzar uh, after he kind of got himself, his eyes finally opened and he, and he declared God for who he really is. This is Nebuchadnezzar. And then he says in verse 35 again, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing 
he, God, does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? God is God. And he knew Adam and Eve was going to sin and he created them still because he simply can. Because he could and he did because he's God. He doesn't have to give a reason to anyone as to why he would choose to create whatever it is he chooses to create. He doesn't have to give a reason to be frank of to anything that he does within his creation. He doesn't. So he is God. He is king. He is creator. He is almighty supreme ruler. He can do whatever he wants. And none of us, nothing that's created can say to him, well, why do you do that? Why, why did you do that? What, what, why, why was that necessary, God? That seems mean. No, that, that seems unfair. No, we don't get to respond and, and question God in that manner because, again, he is unique. He stands alone. He sits as king on the hill and he can do with whatever he can do with his creation, whatever he wants to, because he is God. We might not like that answer because you know why? Because in our sinful nature, for those of us who are believers and those who might be watching it that aren't believers, in our sinful nature, we believe we're God. L lowercase g's, the one that says he's the God above all God. That would include ourselves. We like to believe that we're God-like. And we get to question the sovereign about what he chooses to do with his creation. The audacity of us to want to question God, like, why would you do that, God? Who are us to question the one that created us? Because if he didn't want to create us, none of us would be here to question him in the first place. He's God. And it's arrogant of us to question him. So he made Adam and Eve knowing they were going to sin simply because he can. And he did. Everything God creates, he does so because he can and for his glory from flies to galaxies, from atoms to dung, you name it. Anything from space to the smallest molecule on the dirt in this planet, he made it because he can and he did so for his glory. Things we find useful to things we find useless, he made it. There are things that, that scientists like to call vestiges. These are things that aren't necessary, but we still have them like our appendix or something like that. And a lot of people wonder, well, that's according to evolution. Uh, that was something that was left over from us evolving. No, no, that's not what it was. God made it on purpose for his reasons, for his glory, because he can. So if he made a body part that we don't, quote, use or don't really have, quote, of use of, it's not for just any old thing. It's because he can, and it was for his glory. That's why. There is an author by the name of Mike Err. This is one of his quotes from his book. He said this, God delights in what he has made, even if it serves no discernible purpose. God can create. He can destroy. Uh, uh, he can do whatever he wants with his creation because he can, and he did, and he does so for his glory. So the first answer to this question of if God knew Adam and Eve would sin, why did he bother to create them? God created Adam and Eve knowing they would sin because he could and wanted to, and he did so for his glory. I might sound like a broken record, but I really need to hammer that in. Paul even wrestles with this in the book of Romans when he highlights that God is the potter and we are the clay. Romans 9. And he says of us, who are we the clay to question the potter and what the potter wants to do with the clay? If the potter chooses to make a clay for the sake of just burning and destroying it, guess what? He can do that because he's the potter. And if the potter makes a clay, he makes something out of clay that he chooses to honor. He chooses to lavish his, his grace and his love and his favor upon. He can do so because he's the potter. Paul says clearly for vessels for honor and vessels for destruction. 
The potter can do that because the potter is the one that controls and molds and builds something with the clay. The clay has no right to declare, what are you doing? Why did you make me like this, etc." And so we see that clear through scripture. He made them because he, even though he knew they would sin, because he can and he wanted to, and he did so for his glory. We're going to continue on because there is a second part, second answer to this question. If God knew Adam and Eve would sin, why did he bother to create them? Because God's plan was never for man to be the hero. Which, again, is how we often like to answer this question. We make it about us. He he made Adam and Eve and knew they were going to sin because what? He gave them free will. He let them choose their own destiny. Yeah, no, no, it ain't got squat to do with us. No, that's not right. Bible is clear. God's plan was never for man to be the hero. It was never for Adam to be the hero. It was never for Adam to justify or be or justify himself or justify humanity that would come from his line before God. That was never the plan ever. And that, again, is a hard pill for us to swallow because it continues to remove us from the seat of prominence and places God back on the throne and says, no, this is all about God because it is because he's God and we're not. Uh, in one of my systematic theology classes, as we were going through one of our textbooks, the author, Dr. Elmer Towns, gave a brilliant explanation of why God would even place the tree in the garden and command Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that is another tough ta question to tackle. Like, why would God place that tree in the garden and then tell them not to eat it? Why not just not create that tree altogether? Problem solved, right? But he did it for a reason. Remember, God does nothing without a purpose, okay? He does nothing by accident. Everything God does is on purpose for a purpose. And so he placed the tree in the garden. So this is what the, the, the Dr. Towns is saying, is that he put it there and then told Adam and Eve not to eat of it. You ready? To test them to confirm their innocence or to, for them to see and prove that they couldn't pass the test. Now, that's where you can say free will comes in absolutely because he gave them the option to choose upon themselves to obey God or to disobey God. But he placed it there for the purpose of for the purpose of man to either confirm his innocence or to deny his innocence and then ultimately do what we now know is bring sin and death into this planet, into all of cre into the in creation. So in the garden, the command for Adam was to confirm his innocence. And if Adam would have not chosen to eat of the fruit of the tree, if he would have slapped that fruit out of Eve's hand and was like, no, that's not what we supposed to be doing. You need to go make it right with God. Then what would have happened? And this is a good thing. But then you'll see how this is not a good thing. Um, what would have happened is he would have passed the test in the garden. And any child that was born from his seed, unlike being born into sin, which we all are, because Adam sinned, sin now enters through his lineage. If he would have confirmed his innocence, then man would have been born innocent. That sounds like a good thing. But his innocence wouldn't have been an eternal innocence. It would have been a temporary innocence. Man simply would have been born in innocence, but man still would have had to freely choose to obey or disobey God with every single decision of every single moment of their life. So that doesn't guarantee if Adam would have confirmed his innocence that man at some point, human, some human later, could have, it still could have been Cain for all we know. It could have been literally just in his family. It might not have got out of Adam's family before the first man would have sinned. The first human would have sinned. That doesn't mean that that would have brought, quote, sin back into the line of Adam. No, man would have still been born innocent. However, man would have been born innocent, ready with the capability of trespassing God's commands. So that would have still been uh, a reality The eternal plan of God was always for Jesus to justify man so that man could be justified forever. 
That is why God placed the tree in the garden. That is why, even though he knew Adam and he knew Adam and Eve were going to sin, he still created them. Because the plan of God was never for man to be the hero. It's always been for Jesus to be the hero. It's never been for Adam to justify himself before God by passing the test and therefore man would have been born into innocence. That would have given man something to boast before God. It would have gave man a reason to boast before God. No, the eternal plan of God was always for Jesus to justify man through faith in him so that man could be justified forever. I'm gonna go to Ephesians now and I want you to see this from the book of Ephesians, how Paul lays it out in the first three chapters. I'm not gonna read the first three chapters. I'm gonna just highlight some verses from the first three chapters. Um, and you'll see how, uh, how this is true. Um, Ephesians chapter one, I'm gonna read verses one through four first. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, the saints, that is those who are set apart in God, set apart in Christ, who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse four. The foundation of the world long before Adam was ever created. That we should be, we, saints, those set apart in Christ, we should be holy. That is set apart, holy, consecrated unto God and without blame, justified before him in love. All of that took place before the foundation of the world in Christ. That is, we're seeing the, 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 this is one of several verses we're gonna read in Ephesians, but what you're seeing here is Paul is laying it out, hey, Jesus was always meant to be the hero, always. This is always revolved around Jesus. He is the centerpiece. He is the sun that our planets, the planet of our lives revolves around. We are not the sun in the galaxy of life. Jesus is the sun in the galaxy of life, and we revolve around him. This is all about Jesus. Go to chapter 2, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 and 10. Many of us are familiar with this, but I bet we never put it back in the garden as to the reason why God would allow Adam and Eve. He would still create Adam and Eve knowing that they were going to sin. We probably never put these three verses back in the garden. Now, I want you, in light of us reading chapter one, verses one through four, listen to how chapter two, verses eight through 10 sound now. For by grace, you have been saved, rescued through faith and that not of yourselves, not by man, not something that man could have did. Paul is saying, man here, before I even finish the rest of it, did not justify himself. Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Who is the focus on? God. Who is the focus being taken off of? Man. Who is the hero of this story right now so far in verse 8? God. Who is not the hero? Man. Are we seeing the theme here? Not of works, verse 9. Not of works. Not of the effort of passing the test. Not of the effort of obeying the law, which again was another test. There's no, no, it is not because of us so that man, what? Cannot boast, not of works lest anyone should boast. This goes back to the garden. And then we get to verse 10, which many of us like to stop at verse nine, but read verse 10, because verse 10 tells you it's anchored in eternity past. For we, we, the saints, those who are set apart in Christ, those who by grace through faith are in Christ now, we are his workmanship, his clay, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, which according to chapter one, verses four, was before the foundation of the world that we should walk in them. This had already taken place long before Adam and Eve ever existed. This was the plan of God all along, long before he even created creation. The goal has always been for Jesus to be the hero. 
I'm sorry, I'm getting loud, y'all, but I'm a preacher. I get passionate. Go to chapter three. I want you to see some more. I'm going to read verses eight through 11. You know, Paul is in smack dab in the middle of a thought here. So we just want to jump in because there is some 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 language and some phrases that he communicates that, again, is vital to the point that's being made along with answering this question. Chapter three, verse eight. To me, Paul says, who am less than the least of all the saints? This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Notice that second time now. Verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. That is those who have been set apart, called out from the world, called into Christ. Shall be made might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This that Paul is communicating was a part of the he's saying is part of the eternal purposes of God. This was something that was already agreed upon within the Trinity to happen long before they created creation. And then you can cross-reference this with Colossians 1, 15 through 18, which just makes it abundantly clear. Christ is preeminent. He is the focal point. He is what is prime. So the second answer to this question of uh, if, if God knew Adam and Eve would sin, why did he bother to create them? Here's the second answer to this question. God created Adam and Eve knowing they would sin because his plan was for Jesus to justify man for God's glory and not Adam justify man for man's glory. Hopefully we see the answer to this question is nothing to do with us. It is all about God as it should be always about God. So as difficult of a question as this is, and um, I pray that uh, I've done my due diligence in communicating it clearly and soundly according to scripture. Um, but the, 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 the final nail that we need to all be reminded of, the anchor to all of these things, is Christ and Christ alone. He created Adam and Eve, knew they were going to sin, not for the sake of Adam and Eve sinning, not for the sake of him making a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. He did so with the plan already in place long before creation ever existed for Jesus to be the hero. And because he's God and he can do whatever he pleases in the heavens and in the earth. And we, as his creation, have no right to question why he would create Adam and Eve knowing they were going to sin. Why not make them perfect from the beginning? Who are we to question God? He didn't have to make us in the first place. That is arrogant of us. So the humble posture is to acknowledge that God is God. We are not. He can do whatever he pleases and whatever he pleases to do will always be perfect and for his glory because he is God. And yet, even though he is high and seated on high and lofty, he chose to come low and wrap himself in flesh in the man, Jesus Christ, still to be the center of attention because he is God to rescue his creation to rescue mankind to restore what sin is broken it's all about god it is not about us and the story that we call life that we are living in is his story and he is the main character he is the protagonist it is about him we play minor roles in his story but praise god that we get to be a part of him rescuing this redemption that he's already playing in eternity past uh, it is a privilege for us to know Christ. It is a honor for us to be called his children, to be a part of his kingdom and then get to live out his mission on this planet because he didn't have to do it for any of us. And he chose to do so because he can and he wanted to for his glory. So that is all. Sorry, I, I, I would have continued on, but um, I hope I've ad adequately answered that question and really put the light back on where it belongs, to, where it's supposed to be on God 
and him being supreme and magnificent uh, and taking it off of us because it's not about us. It's all about God. So that's my answer to the question. Um, what was the last verse you just read? I read Ephesians chapter three, verses eight through 11. That was the last verse verses I just read. Can you repeat the scriptures you went through? Sure. Um, to the first answer to the question, I went through Psalm 115, verse three, Psalm 135, verses five and six, Job chapter 23, verse 13, Daniel chapter four, verse 35. For the second answer to this question, I went through Ephesians chapter one, verses one through four, chapter two, verses eight through 10, chapter three, verses eight through 11. Those will be the verses that I went through to answer this question. Um, thank you. Good questions. I get passionate, so I probably got loud and I probably went fast. Praise God. This is being recorded, which means almost like a dope rap. You can pause and go back and rewind and be like, what did he just say? Because I do that with Eshawn Burgundy all the time. Man, I love me some Eshawn. Shout out to the homie Eshawn. Um, OK, question. Is it a sin to ask God why in your prayer time? No. No. So let me clarify if maybe what I communicated sounds like we should never ask God a question. No. If the posture of our heart is, hey, God, I am like, you know, baffled right now, you know, as to whatever has happened in my life or is happening in the world. And and and, I, and I'm coming to you, you know, as God asking you a question that I trust that you can answer. That is all fine. He, we, he, he desires that. We see that in scripture in the psalm. He can handle our rage. He can handle our frustration. He can handle our praises. He can handle our valleys. He can handle all of that. All the range of emotions he can handle. And praise the Lord, Jesus experienced it as well without sin. So we have a high priest that intercedes on our behalf in the heavenly places. Um, the why that becomes a sin is, which is what James talks about, is when we doubt and the why is from a place of doubt. And I don't mean doubt like, I'm not quite sure God, but but doubt as in, I don't believe God can, or, or, or you know, uh, I don't think he, he's strong enough, like as if there's some impotency in God, you know, that would then be a sin, or in, in a posture of arrogance, we question him, which what many scientists, many those who are very intellectual that wanna question why God would and wouldn't do something, presume to speak, for the holy, um, when we approach our, we approach the throne from that kind of arrogant posture, it is a sin, absolutely. Um, but that should be contrasted with the humble questions of why, because we are just truly baffled um, and we're acknowledging our ignorance of not knowing the answer to a question and we are going to the one who knows all things. That's completely different. Hopefully I, I answered your question. Any other questions? This is that time now where if you have some questions, go ahead and shoot it to me. And uh, Lord willing, by the, by the power and wisdom of the Holy Spirit, I'll do my best to answer them. What role does free will play in this? Um, in, in the fact that Adam and Eve freely chose to disobey God. That would be the only role free will chose and it played in this. Um, when he placed him in the garden, he gave him a command, part of him, creating us in his image is we too have a, a volition where we can choose things, you know, right, wrong, good, bad, left, right, et cetera, uh, just as God is free to choose to do whatever he wants. Uh, that's the thing that remember, we gotta anchor our free will in his, and our free will is limited. God's free will is unlimited. God can freely do whatever he wants, whatever he wants. You ready? Even violating our free will, because it's not a violation, because he's the potter and we're the clay. God truly is the only completely free being, okay? But because we have been made in his image, he has given us the ability to freely choose as well. And we exercise that, and we saw Adam and Eve exercise that when God placed the tree in the garden, told them not to eat of it, and then allowed the serpent to slide in and try to convince them to disobey God. They had the choice to say no to the serpent and yes to God or no to God and yes to the serpent. They chose to say no to God and yes to the serpent. And therefore, here we are 10,000 years later or something like that. All righty. 
So um, thank you guys for your time. Um, and I pray my all is in all seriousness. My my prayer is that um, you don't walk away from this Bible study feeling like, you know, you suck uh, or walk away from this Bible study feeling less than, um, you know, as in, in light of the questions that we did, we talked about, like that your choice doesn't matter um, or your questions in prayer, you know, somehow wrong. Um, no, that is not what I hope you walk away with. What I hope you walk away with is what I hope you walk away with is how great and big God is. And life is not about us. Even down to the question of Adam and Eve and why would he create them knowing they would sin? That question has nothing to do with us. It is all about God for his glory because he's God. And I would hope this will lead you to a deeper worship as you realize how huge God is and yet how he humbled himself to wrap on our humanity to rescue us. That is the epitome of a hero and it is God, not man. And that should make us want to scream hallelujah from our life and our mouths. So, um, Okay, one more question came in, but I hope that's what you walk away with above all else. Do you believe that the Ten Commandments would have existed if Adam and Eve didn't sin? Yes, yes, because again, as I said earlier, um, even though Adam and Eve would have passed, and that's we let's okay, let's say they both would have obeyed, uh, even though Adam and Eve would have passed the test, it would have only confirmed their innocence, which meant that as mankind was birthed through the you know, mother and father of humanity, um, they would have simply been born in innocence, but it wouldn't have made them perfectly innocent. They, it wouldn't have made them perfect, whereas they could have never sinned. They still would have had the ability to choose to obey or disobey God. Um, and at some point, somebody would have disobeyed God, as we see even with the angelic beings, um, that a third of them disobey God and God casted them out of the heavens. Um, the same at some point probably would have happened with humanity. There would have been no guarantee that humanity would have never trespassed God's command. Um, and so more than likely, given the track record of humanity, uh, somebody would have broke it. And then that would have brought in sin still. Um, but it would have been sin committed rather than sin part of the nature. Um, and he still would have to give a law uh, to restore what sin has now damaged, which would have been that initial innocence. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Question that I'll need clarity on probably in the next video is the scripture that says an evil spirit from the Lord tormented Saul. Now the from Samuel. Does God summon evil spirits? Yeah, that's definitely uh, another question for another study. Um, the answer is. We probably need to look at it in its context as well as in the language to determine if evil is actually what's being used in the Hebrew there for 1 Samuel 16. Uh, what is the context for evil? Are we talking about like a demon, you know, like that is one of a, a fallen angel? Uh, be, uh, or are we talking about, uh, uh, which I'm assuming it probably is, um, or are we talking about something else? Um, so I, I don't, I'm not studied up on that enough to be able to tell you the context of that. Um, I do know God allows uh, the the fallen angels, those evil spirits, uh, to to and he uses them in his will to carry out different things. Um, we see that in Ephesians, actually the very last chapter, uh, spiritual warfare. We see that in Daniel, uh, etc. So uh, I know he allows them uh, some kind of uh, uh, all allotment of time and and space uh, to 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 carry out certain things, but it, he always has a leash on him. We see that at clear scripture, even in Job, when the Bible says that Satan said he has kind of been to and fro throughout the land looking for somebody to pick on. Um, and he went to God and asked him. Um, so that would kind of give us an idea. Um, summon, I wouldn't use the word summon, uh, but allow definitely would be a word, but I would have to go do some research to make sure I, I get it right in the context. Um, okay. All right. Thank you. Great questions spot on. And um, again, hopefully you, you, you walk away in awe of God, uh, 
uh, humbling ourselves before our holy almighty king and um, desiring to truly revere him in our life as God and not us as God. Feel me? Okay. Other than that, I'm done. It's, it, it's been my pleasure. And uh, you can always, you got p4cm.com. You can always come check me out on my website, biblicallyshaped.com, biblicallyshaped.com. I blog there. I post stuff like what, what p4cm is doing there as well. So, um, all right. Look forward to seeing you guys next Friday to tackle enough another tough question. Take care.